Uh, thank you, everyone, for turning up, especially Thursday, especially if you went to our AWR party last night. Um, congratulations on making it. What I, uh, my name is John Dunn, AWR, and uh, I'm support engineer there. What I'd like to talk about today is pretty standard signal integrity type problem. It, it basically is you've got a board with a signal. Uh, you're going on to some kind of interposer. We're going to use a uh, VGA type uh, uh, module technology, pretty standard stuff. And then uh, from there, uh, we move on to a chip. Uh, and we're going to do bond wire technology on that. Uh, this is what I just said. Now, the design specifications for this is we'd like the return loss to be greater than 20 dB through 20 gigahertz. And here you see a picture of it. You can see the uh, line on the left, port one there. Of course, we're going to use EM simulation. We go up through the, uh, one of the balls, the signal ball, the BGA, over to, on up over to the bond wire and onto the chip where you see the other port. So this would be a, a fairly standard EM simulation uh, using finite element methods. Uh, and I assume most of you are familiar with that. So what I want to do is two things. I want to show you kind of the typical optimization thought process that a designer would go through to improve this uh, performance. And while I'm doing that, I would like to point out a couple features in Analyst, which is our finite element simulator uh, that the designer used uh, in order to make things a little bit easier. Okay, we're seeing the uh, same structure, of course, from the top, which is where the designer would draw or import P cells that have been pre-configured. And the first thing I'd like you to notice here is that the uh, designer uh, actually, of course, does not want to simulate the entire module. Uh, it'd be a waste of time. Uh, he or she is only interested in this one net at this time and the transition path. So you will notice the simulation boundary here is not over the entire module. Uh, they've rather just drawn it over part of it. Very easy to do. And you know, obviously cuts down the simulation time tremendously, less to mesh. And they still get the performance. At the very end of the process, after they've optimized the transition, uh, they then will simulate the entire module. You see it here in 2D, and on the right, you see it in 3D. Uh, one little note here, we do simulate the air. Uh, it is meshed in the air. It doesn't look like it. I turned off the air mesh so you can see the other mesh. But obviously, with finite element method, it's meshed uh, throughout the space. Uh, another little point in the software I'd like to point out, you'll notice that port 1 is at the edge of the boundary. Uh, and in the software, when you put the line to the edge, put, plop down a port 1, it automatically is a wave port. One of the things we try to do in our software for circuit designers is we try to make reasonable assumptions. So when you put a port on a boundary, it's a wave port. And for you uh, 3D EM gurus, it is using the power current definition of impedance and it is uh, using one mode, of course. It's actually doing two modes and checking that the second one is evanescent as a safety check. But, so it's picking the right number of modes. It's picking a reasonable impedance. You don't have to worry about it. What if you want to change that? You can behind the scenes, OK? But we're trying to set things up in a reasonable way. A little hard to see from this picture, but there is a port 2 at the end of that bond wire. It's an internal port because it's not up to the edge of the box. You throw it there, automatically a circuit port, all ready to roll. Okay, So you're not sitting there fiddling uh, with all these settings. OK, here's the initial uh, result uh, from 10 to 20 uh, gigahertz. And you can see the return loss is not meeting uh, the criteria. Uh, rather, it is certainly less than 20 dB. So we need to improve the performance so the next thing the designer is faced with, how do you do that? Okay. So let's get into it. 
the simulation region, when the designer looks at it, uh, they decided that there are basically three obvious places to look. We've got the line on the board. We've got the transition through the BGA. That's two. And then three would be over the bond wires over to the chip. They're kind of three obvious spots where something might go wrong. And so, of course, what the designer is going to do is, again, change the simulation boundary, isolate the part they're interested in, get the port set up, look at the results, and then compensate this thing somehow to get better performance. And let's go ahead and do that. So, region one, line on the board. You can see the box has been made smaller on the left. They're just interested in that region. Uh, if I zoom in on the right, you can see they actually added a port uh, at the end of the line, and that would be an internal port because it does not go to the edge of the box. All right? Uh, a subtlety here, when you start adding ports, uh, you have to ask where the ground return of the port is. So sometimes you want to add, do sort of a plus minus configuration, have a one plus, a one minus, so you can specify the return. Because when you make that simulation boundary and change it, remember you're only simulating in that region. It doesn't know anything about the rest of the module. If you accidentally don't include your ground via in your simulation region, you have completely changed the grounding of the system. Okay. So when you start cutting these things up with the boundaries, it's great, it simulates faster, but you can fundamentally change the physics. How do you avoid that? Well, uh, either you're smart and you know that, or you're not smart and you do a lot of them and then you know that, okay? So, but be thinking always, what's the ground return? Have I, do I still have that? For example, if I got rid of a ground via, maybe I'm in trouble, the current will totally reroute. Or the other thing to watch out for is remember that boundary. Uh, this case, it's an approximate open, so it, it simulates like nothing is past the box. Um, you might have a situation where right on the other side of that boundary is another line. And in reality, the things couple, and you won't get that coupling. So when you're drawing these boxes, you've got to use a little common sense. And common sense means you've done a bunch of them and gained experience. Uh, we haven't quite made this yet where you can just hit a button and it will make the best boundary. We're, we're assuming you know nothing. Uh, you, you shouldn't affect the ground return. And you should uh, not neglect important coupling when you make that box. Uh, of course, this designer knows that and was careful to do that. If you look at the results of just this section, they're on the right, and you can see the return loss is well above 20 dB. Okay, Nothing is reflecting from this thing. Very, very small value. It looks good, uh, and we're not going to worry about it. They go to the next region, the transition region from the board up through the BGA onto the interposer, the module. And the thing I want to point out here is notice the ports on the right. Now, they had to add these because they changed the box, and they weren't there before. Notice that in this situation, they have a 2 and two, two minuses for the port name. What's going on there is port 2 is excited. The minus 2s are hooked together. Think of them hooked, just shorted together, same number. And what we're doing is we're driving this differentially. So 2 minus 2, you can, you can think of as a transformer, current in, current out. And the reason they're doing this, when they made the new box, they wanted to make sure the current return, the ground of 2, was the same as in the actual module, the actual circuit. So again, there's a little bit of experience and wisdom here where that designer knows that's that ground return, and they better keep it the same. So the big story in this is you can whack this stuff up. It's a great idea. But be aware of the physics. Where's the ground return, isolation, et cetera? 
or you can start cutting things in places that give completely uh, misleading answers. Oh, excuse me, I never talked about the results, did I? So if you look here on the right, the result, it is less than 20 dB by quite a bit. We have to improve this transition, and we'll get to that uh, in a minute. OK, and the third region is the bond wire transition. Obvious candidate. If you look at the left, again, there's that differential drive, the 1 and the minus 1s, because we know that's the way the current's going to drive. Bond wire is included uh, using, uh, they didn't draw it. Um, you've heard this story before. They use pre-configured uh, pre P-cell. They just plunk it down, and it draws the bond wire. And then they come over to the chip, and we added another internal, uh, excuse me. Actually, that's a wave port. Is that a wave port? Hard for me to see from there. I think it's on the edge of the box. It's a wave port if it is. OK. So again, you have to be careful with these assumptions. If you look at the bottom, uh, it's not as bad as the BGA transition, but certainly at the higher frequencies, it's not meeting spec. It is uh, certainly less than 20. Uh, DB. Okay, so at this point, our designer, of course, goes in, takes the S parameter blocks, uh, and starts, you know, seeing what they look like. Uh, on the left here, uh, you are seeing uh, the efforts in doing this. So I'll take you through a little bit of this to give you the philosophy. Uh, the block you see, of course, is the S parameters, and the designer thought, and this is kind of actually instructive, so the BGA transition, the designer's thinking was the current is changing as it goes up the BGA. So normally if we have current and the path changes, it's inductive, right? You would think of it as a little wire, a little inductor. We've added inductance by that BGA. Therefore, we should add a capacitance in shunt, which you see, which will compensate for the BGA. That is for the inductance. And that's the philosophy. Uh, and you can see the person uh, trying to match that, having some trouble. Uh, they then found out that if they put two capacitors, one at each end of that S parameter file, that transition, they got a little better. And this is the kind of game uh, that they were playing to see what's going on. OK? Now, the interesting thing is here, and it's very hard for you to see from this distance on this slide, but the blue, the values of the capacitor, is negative. Negative. They tried to improve the performance by adding shunt capacitance, but actually it was better with negative capacitance. So we'll add a negative capacitor, which is ridiculous, right? So what went wrong? What went wrong is the designer didn't have very good intuition of what the BGA was doing. It turns out with BGA ball transitions, they actually are usually capacitive. And the reason they're capacitive is you have other BGA balls nearby that are ground balls. And these things are big. So there's a lot of capacitive coupling to ground. And it completely can dominate the inductive effect of the height of the ball. So when you actually start doing these things, uh, a lot of people, after they work with them for a while, find out, hey, the, ball, the BGA ball is capacitive. I need inductance to compensate it. And that's what this designer found out. They didn't know that. They were uh, naive. It was their first time. It was actually my boss, so I shouldn't say they, were, they didn't know what they were doing. But they learned by that. And they said, hey, John. And I said, yeah, they're actually usually capacitive. They found out. So what are we going to do? We're going to add inductance. <clears throat> Excuse me. And this is the story. They actually need inductance. So how do we add inductance? Uh, and there are a couple ways to do that. Again, dividing it up, adding the internal port. And of course, once we have these internal ports and we simulate, then on the circuit schematic, we can add an inductor. Find out how much inductance we need, go back to the layout, and now we got to play around to see how to get it. And so that's what he, uh, the, the, he's doing here. 
and he finds out how much inductance he needs or negative capacitance and now goes about trying to fix it. And there are a couple ways it is done. Obvious things to do would be to add more line length. Uh, you don't want to do that. Uh, you'd like to move away, you'd like to move it away from the ground to reduce the ground capacitance. Yeah, let's move the balls farther apart. That's great till you have to manufacture it because it said, sorry buddy, it's on a fixed grid. Can't do that. So after playing with this uh, for a bit, um, what he decided to do is he said, aha, the inductance is driven by the entire loop. You know, it's both the current and its return. I'll put extra inductance in the ground return. And the way he did that is these guys come off the module and those are your ground vias. That's your ground return, okay? And so what we do, before the ground vias on the board go back down to ground, we make that longer. We've increased the current path in the ground return, right? adds inductance, compensates for capacitance, and the manufacturing engineers go, yeah, we can actually build that, that's no problem. So everybody's happy. Okay, if we think now to the third section to finish this up, remember we had our bond wires, and uh, they are inductive, of course. We need to add capacitance. The designer thought of a couple ways to do it, and, um, Basically what they did is they took the pad that the bond wires are on and made it bigger. They got the pad closer to the side grounds, it increases capacitance and compensates for the bond wire inductance. And this is details of sweeping the pad length in order to find out the optimal pad size to uh, do that compensation. And actually I should kind of show you the final thing, shouldn't I? Uh, if you look at the best value there, they basically met specs, or just about. I think they were ended up a little bit below 20 dB. Uh, this is, of course, S11, so take the negative of that for the return loss. Okay, in conclusion, um, what are the important points? The first thing is the designer got it optimized. The way they did that is they broke the problem up into sections, three sections, looked at each one, came up with a physical model, made the mistake of thinking inductive for the BGA, actually capacitive, figured it out, added inductance by adding it to the ground return, and then for the bond wire part, which was inductive, adding capacitance. The other thing, so I, I think it's kind of a nice example. Uh, I used to work at Tektronix and Signal Integrity. We did this stuff all the time. So if you're new to it, this is pretty typical flow of how you think of these things. In terms of software, use model, very easy in our software where you subdivide it, but be careful when you do it. I'll say it one more time. Don't go putting the simulation boundary anywhere, right? You gotta make sure the ground return on the ports is the same, or you'll get you know wildly different values and make sure when you make the simulation boundary that you're not neglecting that really important element just on the other side, it's coupling to. And uh, with that, I will conclude. Thank you very much. Have a great rest of the show, everyone.